Welcome to Roswell United Methodist Church Online. My name is Marian Brown, one of the associate pastors, and this is our on-demand version of the sermon that will be preached on this Sunday morning. And please know that our Sunday services will be live streamed beginning at 9 a.m. for the contemporary service and 11.15 for the traditional service. If you would like to have the entire worship experience on demand, that will be available on Monday morning. We appreciate you being a part of our online community and we invite you to be active and participate through your giving. And so we thank you for your support and your generosity. Before we listen to this Sunday sermon, let's have a moment of prayer. Gracious and holy Lord, we ask that you remind us that wherever we are, we are on holy ground. And so may you help us make space. So may we receive a message that you have for us in this moment. Be in our hearts so that it's open. Be in our ears so that they are open and be a part of our lives so that we are open to receive a challenge and an invitation. Work within us now and all around us so that we may know your presence and we may feel it fully. Through a moment now of words and scripture, speak to us, amen. Let's listen to this Sunday sermon. Greetings, my name's Jeff Ross. I'm one of the associate pastors here at the Roswell United Methodist Church. Uh, thanks for tuning in today and being a part of this service. Our scripture passage comes from uh, the book of Exodus in the Old Testament, chapter three, verses one through 10. And it says there, now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the far side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And there the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. So Moses thought, I'll go over and see this strange sight, why the bush does not burn up. When the Lord saw that Moses had gone over to take a look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, here I am. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals for the place where you are standing is holy ground. And then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. At this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. And the Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt, and I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I'm concerned about their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey, the home of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Parasites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. And now the cry of the Israelites has reached me, and I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now, go, I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. Let us pray. God, we give you thanks for this day, for the opportunity to spend a little time in your word, and we ask you to speak to us, guide us, let us hear your voice, and let us hear your call on our lives. For it's in Christ's name we pray, amen. Well, this is uh, certainly an interesting passage of Scripture. 
Second book of the Bible, uh, it follows the story of Genesis where everybody's kind of getting sorted out. And at the end of Genesis, uh, the Israelites have made their way to Egypt. Joseph has brought them there uh, and they are welcomed uh, by the Egyptians. But that is all changed in the first part of the book of Exodus. There's a new king, uh, Joseph, and uh, his family have long since passed away. And so there's a struggle, there's a battle that's taken place. Uh, earlier in the first and second chapter, Moses uh, has been born, saved, uh, grown up, uh, had a confrontation with some of the Egyptians and has fled uh, to this land. He has met a, a, a young lady, uh, has gotten married, started a family. And, uh, and so we pick the story up as Moses is um, enjoying, I guess you could say, life. Uh, he's a long way from home, but he's found a new family. Uh, and he has uh, work that he's tending to. And so at the beginning of this uh, passage that we just read, uh, verse 1, it says that he's tending the flock, which is an uh, interesting uh, storyline in the Bible. It's where we find David when uh, he is uh, found and noticed by God and by the prophet Samuel. It's also what the shepherds were doing on that first Christmas Eve. They were tending the flock. And so it's a, I guess it's a, a popular time for the angel, for God to speak to, to people. And so the angel appears uh, in the bush. And this is kind of an interesting uh, flow of the narrative here. The angel appears as a flame in the bush. It doesn't consume the bush. And so uh, it ev evidently is over there somewhere. Uh, and Moses is tending the flock and he notices it and maybe looks away and looks again and uh, odd probably to see a bush on fire. And then he notices something odd about it and it's not burning up. Uh, it's, it's burning, but it's not being consumed. And so that's a strange enough sight, a, a strange sight indeed. Uh, so he walks over to the bush to take a closer look. And it's interesting that it's at that point that God speaks to him. Uh, and it, it's not really clear how long that took. Maybe uh, Moses saw it. Maybe no, Moses knew that there was something weird about that. Maybe he wanted to engage, but didn't want to engage. And as we read this passage a little bit more, uh, maybe he knew this was uh, something uh, that he kind of did or didn't want to, uh, to do. Uh, but it's only as he engages the bush, gets closer and looks at it, that God speaks. And, and it says, when God sees that Moses had, my interpretation, taken the bait, uh, then God speaks. Moses, Moses. Um, and then God spends some time telling Moses that he has heard, God has heard, the cry of the people of Israel uh, that are in bondage, in slavery in Egypt, conditions are bad. Uh, and uh, so God explains to Moses that he's the God of Jacob and the God of Joseph and uh, the God of Abraham and that he's come here to rescue everybody. And then the last part of this uh, verse 10 is, okay, Moses, uh, everybody ready? Let's go. You're going to be the one to do this. Well, that presents a little bit of a problem. I don't know if you've ever had an encounter with God, felt like God was leading you, guiding you to do something. Uh, sometimes we're excited about those prospects and sometimes not so much. And so it's interesting here uh, what, what takes place. And you get the impression that Moses is not unhappy with his life. Like I said, he, he got married, he's raising a family, he's, uh, uh, he's tending the, the flocks, he's uh, met some really nice people, uh, and uh, there is some trouble back in Egypt if he decides to go back. He's kind of a wanted man. Uh, and so you get the impression that Moses isn't all that passionate about the plight of the Israelites. It's not like he's crying. It's not like he's uh, uh, mourning what's going on back in Egypt to the, his people. 
Uh, it's, it's not like that at all. In fact, if you compare this passage to some other passages, you see a stark difference. If you go to the story of Nehemiah in the, the uh, Nehemiah chapter 1, verses 1 through 5, you find an interesting passage there where uh, Nehemiah is the cupbearer to the king. Uh, he's a Jewish man uh, that has fled in exile when the Babylonians and Persians came through and wiped out Jerusalem. Uh, and, uh, and he's now employed by the king of Persia. And some friends come to see him in Babylon. And, uh, and he asked them, what's going on in Jerusalem? And, and uh, the, the friends say, oh, it's awful. It's terrible. The wall's been destroyed people are, are scavenging for food. It, it's just a bad scene. And with that news, it says in verse 4 of the first chapter of Nehemiah, when I heard these things, I sat down and wept. For some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. Another part of the Bible, Psalm 137, verse 1 uh, it talks about people that are in Babylon that are uh, in exile from Jerusalem because of the wars. And the first verse of the 137th Psalm says, By the waters of Babylon we sat down and wept because we remembered the glory of Zion. Well, Moses doesn't appear to be like that at all. Moses doesn't appear to be excited about going to Egypt, about being this chosen savior, uh, any of that. In fact, if we keep reading in Exodus chapter 3, starting with verse 11, all the way through chapter 4 and verse 17, you find this fascinating uh, dialogue between uh, Moses and God. God starts explaining how uh, God's heard the cry of uh, the Israelites and he's going to go and rescue them. And, and Moses is going to be the, the leader of this movement. Uh, and God's going to give Moses all of these resources. And, and so Moses says, but who am I? Chapter 3, verse 11. But who am I, God? I, I, I'm not a warrior. I'm not a king. I'm not a leader. I, I, no, I don't, I'm not so sure about this. And then in chapter 4, verse 1, it says, well, well, what if they don't believe me? What if they don't listen to me? What if they say to me, God did not appear to you, that you're just making all this up? Well, God continues to explain to Moses, well, okay, so this is how it's going to be. I'm going to give you these tools and resources. You're going to be able to stand up next to Pharaoh and proclaim the power of God. And all of this is going to go well, and you're going to be successful, and we're going to lead the Israelites out of Egypt to this promised land. Um, and then, so chapter 4, verse 10, Moses says, yeah, but... He's still waffling. He says, yeah, but I'm, I'm not a good speaker. I just don't know if I'm the guy that's uh, cut out for this, God. Uh, and then uh, God continues to try to convince Moses that he is the person. I've made the mouth of humans. I, you know, I can give you the words to say. And then Moses finally says in verse 13, God, please send somebody else. And so uh, the, the hysterical verse in this sequence is chapter 4, verse 14, where it says, the Lord's anger burned against Moses. Uh, and finally, God does some more things to convince uh, Moses. Finally, Moses relents. Uh, but it's a fascinating discussion. I, and again, I don't know if you've had those kind of uh, conversations with God. Maybe you feel like God's calling you to something uh, or leading you or wanting to take a bigger role in your life. Uh, and, and you have this argument with God. I'm not ready. It's not the right time. I'm, I'm, I'm just not a good person. Uh, I haven't done things right. I, I just don't know about this. Maybe there's somebody else. And this is so different from other characters in the Bible. Isaiah chapter 6, verse 8, when God comes to Isaiah uh, and says these words, Then I heard the voice of the Lord, Isaiah says, Whom shall I send? 
uh, there's a need. And God is saying, whom shall I send? And Isaiah raises his hand quickly and says, here I am, God, send me. Here I am, Lord, send me. And the same thing in Luke chapter 1, verse 38, where uh, the angel has just described to Mary all of the things that are, are going to happen to her. And her response is, I am the Lord's servant, Mary said. May it be to me as you have said. May it be to me as you have said. You see the uh, whole different sort of take on responding to God. We, we have these uh, uh, responses that are all over the map. Some folks uh, hear the voice of God and are quick to jump in. Other folks hear the voice of God and like, oh no, you're not getting me to do that. I'm not going to do that. Uh, burning bushes and angels uh, coming while we're tending the flocks are, are, is not the norm. It's not the, the way everybody encounters God. And I wonder what your story is. Where have you encountered God? Uh, maybe it's been at a camp, uh, maybe a worship service just like this, maybe a mission trip or vacation Bible school or... Uh, uh, teaching a class or sitting in a class or listening to the radio or uh, reading your Bible and you hear God's voice and, and you're not really sure if God's speaking to you. You're not really sure, uh, is this real? Is this what God wants me to do? And so maybe you check that out with a couple of folks. You ask some friends, you ask some questions. But for a lot of us, our response to feeling like we hear from God is, well, I'm, I'm not equipped, uh, I'm not ready, I'm not knowledgeable, I'm not gifted, I'm not good enough. Um, and, and the sense is that I, I don't really have access to the power of God. I, I don't know where to get that. I, uh, I don't know how to do that. Uh, there's a chance that we don't feel qualified. But God doesn't call the equipped. God equips the called. There's a, a passage in uh, Hebrews chapter 13, verse 20 to 21, that, that sort of speaks to this. And it says, May the God of peace equip you with every good thing so that you may do his will working in you that which is pleasing in his sight. Through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory now and forever. Same thing that is in Matthew chapter 4, verse 19, where uh, Jesus is talking to Peter. Uh, Peter's a fisherman. And Jesus says to Peter, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. So it's clear that, that uh, while we feel like we may not have all that it takes to be the person God has called us to be, uh, that, that God has an ability through the Holy Spirit to give us his power, uh, to work within us, to help us say and do things that we didn't know was possible. If any of you have ever taught or uh, gone on a mission trip or, or served uh, in any way, you've probably noticed that, that uh, what uh, you did uh, seemed to be more than... Uh, you thought you were able to do. Things happened. God was at work. God used you. That's always an astounding thing uh, to be involved in a situation where God uses us uh, and we, we get a sense that there was something going on there that, uh, that was beyond us. And so there's a, a nice litany I want to put on the screen uh, that talks about this, uh, that God doesn't always call the people that uh, are the most dynamic or uh, the richest or the most plugged in in the community. It's often that God uses people who have a good heart, uh, but also sometimes have some things that are going on. Uh, as you can see, this says Noah was a drunk. Abraham was too old. Isaac was a dreamer. Jacob was a liar. Uh, Leah was ugly. Uh, Joseph was abused, um, Rahab was a prostitute, Elijah was suicidal, Jonah ran from God, 
Peter denied Christ. The Samaritan woman was divorced. Uh, Zacchaeus was too small. And Lazarus was dead. So uh, you, can't get, you can't get much worse off uh, in being used by God than to be dead. But uh, there are all kinds of people in all kinds of situations. And one of those situations comes a, a chapter before this. As we look at Moses' reluctance uh, to step in and step up and do what God has called him to, uh, as we look at Moses' questions about his abilities and, and his doubts and concerns, if you go back to the second chapter, there's a fascinating story there. Uh, in the first uh, five or uh, ten verses of that second chapter is the story about Moses' uh, uh, parents uh, putting Moses in a basket in the, the river and then the basket floating downstream. Pharaoh's daughter sees the, the basket, uh, takes the baby and adopts it as uh, her own. And, and that's how Moses is spared uh, and survives and grows up uh, in the, the kingdom of Egypt and becomes a, a person of power and influence. Uh, but the, the story that's not widely talked about is, is the story of uh, Moses' sister. And so Moses' uh, parents are, are struggling because there's an edict that all the children, all the male children, Israelite children, would be put to death under two years old. And so the parents have this young uh, child. They keep Moses for three months, as long as they feared they, they could without being detected. Uh, they take Moses down to the river, put him in a basket, wrap him up really nice, put him in the water. But then something really fascinating happens. It says in verse 4 that Moses' sister stood a distance away to see what would happen to him. And as I read that, I thought, well, that, that's really interesting because this young girl couldn't have been more than seven, eight, six, ten years old. And, and it doesn't say who put her up to that. It doesn't say that anybody put her up to that. It's almost like she has seen the trauma of her parents struggling and talking at night about what to do with this baby boy, her little brother. Uh, everybody's concerned. They're distraught. They can't keep it because the Egyptian soldiers will come and kill it, so they don't know what to do. Uh, and so it, it sounds as if, uh, and I'm reading a lot into the story, but it sounds as if she's been listening to this and she's concerned and she's uh, as uh, distraught over this whole situation as her parents are. Uh, the day comes for her parents to put Moses in the water. Uh, and so she, it, it appears voluntarily, just kind of walks down the Nile to, to see what's taking place, to see what's going to happen. Uh, and uh, and, and something miraculous happens. Uh, she's watching what would happen to him. Uh, again, it seems like she's done this on her own. She's uh, a young girl, but she's not, you know, uh, playing with her dolls up in the house. She's uh, invested in the things and concerns of the family. Uh, she cares about what's going on here. Uh, she's been reading the room well. And, uh, and so when Pharaoh's servants, Pharaoh's daughter's servant finds the baby, brings it to Pharaoh's daughter, it's this sister that has followed the, the little basket down the river to where it's found. Uh, and it's this sister who speaks up and says in verse 7 of chapter 2, shall I go and get uh, the one, uh, shall I go and get one of the Hebrew women to nurse him? And Pharaoh's daughter says, yes, do that. And so Moses' sister goes and gets Moses' mother and brings her to Pharaoh's daughter to nurse her son. That's an incredible story. A story of hope where there is no hope. A, a story where God provides a way when there is no way. Uh, a story of somebody... Uh, 
not necessarily even being called, but responding to the hurt and the pain they see uh, in some other people and uh, try to figure out if there's anything they can do and stepping into a, a situation where maybe they can help. Believing all the while she wouldn't have done this if there wasn't some sense of hope that something could be worked out. And as soon as an opportunity arose, she jumped in and made something incredible take place. Looking for a way when all hope was lost. You know, in, in this story, we have Moses' reluctance. We have some of the other folks that I've mentioned who've been willing to jump in. Uh, folks that have been concerned about the situation, folks who maybe don't seem as concerned about the situation. People with great skills and abilities offered a chance to, uh, to be involved in God's plans and actions. And, and other people, even just small children, that are willing to look beyond themselves and see an opportunity. And so that, that says to all of us that God is moving and acting all the time. Sometimes we get so caught up in our wants and our needs that we come up with excuses about why we can't do anything for anybody else or respond to God's call in our lives. But sometimes we can step out. We can look beyond ourselves. We can access the power that God has given us through the Holy Spirit uh, to act and speak and do things that maybe we didn't think we were able to do. And, and that's the witness of the church, where we step out, where one person has an idea, follows the call of God, and other folks join in with that and help that vision become uh, a reality. I don't know where it is that you might be feeling God's guidance and leading today, but I hope that you are paying attention. Um, I hope that you are uh, looking around and seeing where people are hurting and that you do have a desire to see how it might be that, that God might alleviate the suffering or speak into a situation, or give healing and hope to people who have lost that. Let us pray. God, we give you thanks for this day, for your word, for uh, what you're doing in our lives. We ask you to help us to, to be the people that you've called us to be, to pay attention, to notice what's going on around us. We think we don't have the ability or the strength of the power, but, but we're told, and we know if we really listen closely, that you will and do give us the power and strength to be your people, to accomplish what you call us to do. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us online. It is a blessing to have the gift of technology to have sermon this way. We thank you for participating. And just a reminder, if you wanna see the live services, 9 a.m. on Sunday for contemporary and 1115 Sunday morning for traditional services. And always we will have the full on-demand worship experience on Monday morning. And if there's ever a time that you would like to join us here at the physical location, we're located at 814 Mimosa Boulevard, Roswell, Georgia. We wanna be connected with you. If you have a prayer request, please let us know by emailing pray at rumc.com. And we would love for you to be a part of our ministry through your giving. If you would like to support our campus and our ministries, you can do so at rumc.com slash give. And now hear these words of a benediction. Love without fear, serve with commitment. And in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, go in peace, amen.